Um, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Gabriel Moreno, and I am the manager of design programs here at Arts and Public Life. I'm excited to welcome you to our third virtual Chop It Up. It's been an amazing series so far. We spoke with Monica Chada and Michael Murphy, then Norman Teague and Peter Gaona, and now Amanda Williams and Lake Jayathis. If you're new to us, Arts and Public Life builds platforms in arts and culture for practitioners on the South Side to connect and amplify their work. These platforms focus on four key endeavors, artist residencies, arts education, exhibitions, and creative entrepreneurship. Like so many others in this time, we've been innovating to translate our programs focused on community, connection, proximity, and inclusivity to the digital space. Some upcoming events you can tune into are our ongoing Juneteenth Marketplace, which is a virtual marketplace to celebrate and showcase a selection of black owned arts and culture businesses based on Chicago's South Side. We also offer free online yoga, which happens on Fridays from 9 to 10.30, 9.30 to 10.30, Saturdays from 9 to 10, and then again on Saturdays from 10.30 to noon. We also have a committed knitters group that meets on Wednesdays from noon to 3 p.m. to share their projects and their conversations. And some one-time online events that you can tune into are coming up on July 17th. We will have a restream of our Spinning Home Movies uh, where we worked with the PO Box Collective. On July 20th, we will have a virtual Monday Jazz with Guru Tonic from 7 to 9 p.m. On the 26th, we'll have our virtual Kids Jam from 11 to 12. And then on the 27th, our artist in residence, Ben Lamar Gay, will have part three of his continuing program right on. That'll be happening from 6 to 7. And then finishing July on the 30th, we will have our second episode of our second season of Spinning Home Movies with Seth Parker Woods from 7 to 8 p.m. You can also find past events archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, for instance, our Liberatory Practices event with Sadie Woods and C. Lynn from Juneteenth is archived there, along with all of our Spinning Home Movies DJ sessions and interviews with past artists and residents. And eventually you'll find this conversation there too. Uh, so today, it's my pleasure to be in this conversation uh, with my colleague Newton and our two guests. I'll turn it over to Newton to give some more formal introductions, and thank you for joining us. Great. Thanks, Gabe. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Newton Barani. I'm the Associate Director of Design at Arts and Public Life. I'm an architect and a maker. So with Arts and Public Life, I get to work on the places and spaces for the great work that our teams do to establish new and innovative platforms for the arts on the South Side. I'm thrilled to welcome our guests tonight. They both have established practices that are strongly based in design and in art. Each of them have projects that are place specific, provocative, introspective. So welcome to Amanda Williams and Olala Kanjayafis. Uh, just a bit about each of them. Uh, Amanda Williams is a visual artist who trained as an architect. Her creative practice employs color as a way to draw attention to the complexities of how race shapes how we assign value to space in cities. The landscapes in which she operates are the visual residue of the invisible policies and forces that have misshapen most major U.S. cities. Williams's works inspire new ways of looking at the familiar and are in the process and in process raise questions about urban space and ownership in America. Amanda has exhibited widely nationally and internationally, has been recognized with many awards and fellowships and is deeply involved in several projects right here in Chicago. She lives and works on the South Side. Olala Kinjayafis is also a visual artist that trained in architecture. Lake has exhibited extensively, both nationally and internationally, and has upcoming exhibitions, which are postponements because of the pandemic until 2021, at the Venice Architecture Biennale and at MoMA, the show uh, Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America. He has been recognized with fellowships and grants as well, has spent over a decade creating large-scale artwork for a variety of public places, including the Barclays Arena in Brooklyn, for Coachella Valley Music and Art Festival, for Public Square in downtown Cleveland, Ohio, and recently opened in the waterfront in Alexandria, Virginia, Rot Knit Labor's Legacies, a public artwork. Lake has 
also recently created a series of futuristic visualizations based on the existing Brooklyn, which is where he currently lives and works. Amanda and Lake are collaborating on projects that I want to mention too. The monument to Shirley Chisholm in Brooklyn in Prospect Park. The renderings are just gorgeous. I cannot wait to visit one day. And right here in Chicago, they'll be creating an artwork for the entry for the National Public Housing Museum's permanent home on Taylor Street the last remaining building of the original WPA structures, the Jane Addams homes. Lake and Amanda know each other well. We're really looking forward to this peek into their practices. A few suggestions for everybody who's joining us tonight to best enjoy the conversation. For best viewing, we recommend that you use speaker view in Zoom. All participants will be muted except for the speakers and we request that you turn off your video so that we can focus on our speakers. If you have any technical difficulties, please try to exit and re-enter the Zoom. Uh, I need to let you know that this is being recorded. Video will be available, as Gabe mentioned, um, via our YouTube channel in the future. If helpful, uh, closed captioning is, is activated, so you can turn it on um, at the bottom of your screen um, in the closed caption uh, menu. Uh, we plan to take some questions uh, from the audience in the last 20 minutes of our hour together. Uh, feel free to send along any of those questions during the, ch in, during the course of the hour in the chat. Um, as you think of them, we might be able to squeeze some in in between. So with that, I will launch us. Um, how are you guys doing? You ready? Yeah. What, yeah, you, you, <laughs> great. Are you eating anything good? chop it up um i actually ate just before i just before i logged on i made some um salmon in my new air fryer so i've joined the air oh. fryer craze so i've been pretty much eating salmon every meal <laughs> <laughs> i'm coming to your house i had leftover thai food it perfectly it was tasty that sounds good awesome well i'll get us started so tell us about your hybrid practice design that inform your art practice. What are parts of art that inform your design practice? Where are you embracing things? Where are you letting go of things? Um, all right, I'll begin. I, um, so as you mentioned, my background, I was trained as an architect, went to Cornell University with, uh, along with Amanda. Um, but pretty early on after graduating, um, I quit my job in like 2004 to pursue art full time. And so, um, and I wanted to frame my artistic practice pretty much around our education at Cornell, right? Because uh, I really loved it. I love the studio environment. I mean, I, I can't imagine what I would have gotten to college for if it wasn't for <laughs> the architecture program, but I really love the studio environment because essentially you're given uh, a program and a problem, but it's really up for you, like it's up to you to really develop a kind of comprehensive narrative. And then they really encourage you to use um, whatever medium you want to explore um, really articulating your idea. And I just felt that, you know, that that would be an incredible way to kind of frame a sort of speculative uh, artistic practice. Um, so, you know, some of the difficulties in that, and that's why I like your question about like, what do you keep and what do you let go? Um, you know, in, 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 in architectural education, you have to justify every single thing that you do. And that has been the biggest um sort of hurdle for me to overcome in terms of thinking as an artist and to this day i still do it you know what i mean i still think why am i doing this you know um particularly when the work is speculative architectural work because of course the the, the kind of notion uh, around architecture is sort of fundamental understanding of architecture is that you solve a problem you solve a design problem um, many people believe you can solve social problems with it um, and so that's hardwired into kind of the practice in education. So someone like me who considered myself more of a visual storyteller that uses architecture as a medium, I find it 
you know, uh, kind of a, like an obstruction to like my creativity and sort of creative interests, this constant notion of why am I doing this? What is this for? This is implausible. You know what I mean? This doesn't make sense because it goes against that kind of um, both public understanding of architecture and my particular training. And it's only more and more now that I'm kind of leaning into like, I can do whatever I want with this. <laughs> you know, I don't, have, I don't have to, you know what I mean? Um, but then of course there's still, again, but then, you know, there's still a sense of responsibility, you know, um, through, through, through your artwork, uh, particularly when create, particularly in the public art realm, of course, when you're creating for very specific communities that have uh, very unique uh, histories and, and populations. Um, and so that's where uh, the sort of architectural background, uh, I believe is an advantage. Um, Cause I know a lot of public artists, uh, they're very much married to their ideas. And you know, some of them, I wouldn't say public artists in general are married to their ideas and, and kind of they have a hard time, I don't know, taking feedback or having to change things due to budgetary constraints, due to the scope, due to community input. But for someone like me with an architectural background, you know, that is simply a design challenge. I'm not, uh, you know, it, it doesn't bother me in the least, you know, if, if, if I have to reconsider or rework something that I'm, you know, uh, uh, you know, something that I've created because that simply is, okay, how can I do this with less of a budget? Or how can I work in this material because it needs to be permanent or it needs to, you know, so that's where the architecture um, really comes in and, and sort of, I, I think, enhances the kind of artwork that I'm making. Um, and also makes me sort of very flexible in terms of, you know, respect responding to any variety of conditions and, and working in, in, a, in a variety of, of cities, um, communities, different spaces, et cetera. Yeah, what he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize, I think we, um, so we both quit uh, practicing architecture in a, in a traditional sense, the same time almost. Um, yeah. and, and I would note that what kind of sparked that transition or, or gave us a big fireworks celebration into contemporary art versus architecture was um, being included in Thelma Golden's um, Harlem awesome. World, Metropolis' as Metaphor. Um, yeah. So even though we were on opposite coasts, I was in the Bay Area at the time and, and Lake was in Brooklyn. I mm -hmm. think exactly what you're saying about this kind of, um, it was still just an extension of a way of working and a way we've been trained to think through uh, creative output and so um, I'd practice, I'm three years, I think, three years ahead of Lake at school. But so I had practiced those years in San Francisco um, at two firms. And so I had a lot of the practical experience, but it also was a kind of the, I called it the job lottery because I graduated at the height of the economy and the, and the dot-com industry was sort of skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. So you had these projects with like pretend budgets and programmatic requirements that were very similar to school. So it was like, we want a building that breathes. We want the whole building to sigh. You know, like these were the client briefs. So, I mean, it made it made the, the connection between art and architecture pretty seamless. Um, I I feel like I struggle with the fact that architecture does require a kind of rationale and at least the way we were trained. Um, and I also think the fact that you know that things have to stand up and function puts a you know a level of gravitas with your your ability to kind of understand what you're executing. Um, and so I have a hard time letting go of that with art. And so Lake mm -hmm. is one of a handful of kind of, um, kind of art cohorts that, that you know, I, I think through ideas with. And so he's tired of me because we're working on um, our exhibition for MoMA, the reconstructions mm -hmm. exhibition, which will open next, <laughs> next February. And I have to have an answer and a logic for every single move I'm making throughout this entire process. Yeah, and so yeah. <laughs> incessantly text him like, do you think they meant and or or? Which one, how do you think they, when they said in America or of America? You know, so at some point, like the inability to let go of that is, is a little bit daunting, especially when we're doing these projects that themselves blur the line between art and architecture. So the MoMA exhibition is a great example of that. Venice Biennale mm -hmm. is a great example of that. So it actually becomes really tricky because you, 
you fall back into some of those same, not only those tropes, but those same hangups because there's a lot of angst, I think, and Newtown can probably attest to this. When you, architecture is such a cult, when you choose to get out, there's the guilt still. It's like, oh, you didn't make it, or oh, you're doing that, or, you know, so there's a, there's an odd way you wanna, you wanna prove that you know what you're doing or you wanna prove that the work still can stand up with those questions about uh, kind of spatial acuity. So I think that that is also something I would love to let go. Um, and so I've tried to focus lately on really seeing my practice as um, always public facing. There's always a kind of external something that I'm doing and then, and then really trying to build up my studio practice. So, um, liberating myself from all of the art objects I'm making having to be translations of the public or the community or the the kind of um, site specific work that I'm making. So that's been a great challenge. Um, I'm interested to see how that evolves, but I feel like I finally kind of made that declaration of giving myself permission to not try to make these one-to-one -one correlations or to compartmentalize these components. And I would say it really wasn't until the Chicago Biennial, when sort of the whole world seemed to notice me all at once, that this question about art and architecture just, you know, seems totally baffling to me because it really, for me, as, as Lake was saying, you know, has its genesis in the idea that we were given the freedom to think through a question or an idea and, and be prepared to use any medium. So I mm -hmm. think that that's quite different than the way maybe, um, people who have formal MFAs or formal kind of artistic training um, would see things, you know, so it's always very interesting when I oscillate in those spaces or if I do um, studio visits or sit in on studio reviews for artists, it's very, very different in terms of um, how the logic is formed, how the narrative is told. Uh, so it's, it's been a great kind of, you know, experience to have people that see you as both things or see you as one or the other. <laughs> and then you get into whatever that space is and none of them ever seems to quite be the space we occupy. I think we have our own little family of people that, you know, mm -hmm. that cross those, those that kind of hybridity. Um, mm -hmm. April Banks is another one out in the Bay Area. So there's a, you know, there's a number of us who, I would imagine it's like people that have, not, don't have um, English as a first language or you have a, a native language and then live somewhere where there's another language you can oscillate back and forth seamlessly. And when people ask you how you do it, you don't, you know, you don't know. Like, why did you use the whatever language for garbage can? And then you just spoke to your kids in the other language. You know, it's kind of the same. So I generally don't think about the, the distinction unless it's like a situation like this, or unless you're being interviewed or students, people that are trying to make decisions or trying to really chart their path. Often they, they feel guilty or confused um, if they can't pinpoint exactly where they fall you know, kind of on that spectrum. No, that's 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 very true. I I, I just wanted to comment on that because um, it's so interesting. You know, I'm you know we're we're, we're both still very connected to like the architecture space, uh, particularly like in like the academic architectural space, and then the art world. And I and I'll tell you, like I still feel like an outlier in the art world. You know what I mean? Um, but I still lecture regularly at architecture schools and various architecture programs and um and it really is like switching the language or the dialogue or discourse around the work depending on the audience yes. um i show my artwork to architecture students and uh, you know and i speak about it differently than when i'm showing it in the art world because there is a very different um approach to you know, to the artwork, depending on that audience. Um, but for me, it's it's sometimes even entertaining. And I, and I think that was also the good thing about the sort of architectural education, because in addition to having to justify everything that you do, there's also the post rationale, right? Which is you can transform everything you've done and you can re, uh, like you can re-articulate a product. You know what I mean? So I've shown work and literally change the project statement around that work depending on the grant, <laughs> the, the venue where it's being exhibited, you know what I mean? And, and so um, that's almost become like another part of my art making is the way I talk about my work depending on the audience, you know, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm 
discussing my work with. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's, that's definitely part of that, constantly navigating these, these spaces. Because um, Amanda mentioned the Harlem World Metropolis as metaphor show. And that was a kind of largely misunderstood show <laughs> because the general audience didn't know what to expect from architects or they knew exactly what they were, you know, like they had an expectation of seeing drawings and models, you know? And instead <laughs> they saw kind of our creative process, right? Um, or just, you know, the kind of investigations that, 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 that we really get into um, when we're conceiving of a project, particularly in its early stages. So it's kind of like, it was misunderstood. It was like, where's the basketball? Or like, where's the gym? Where's the hospital? Where's the, you know, the, you know, the cool design for a school? It was like, what is this? Because, I mean, it was, it was just so, it was, um, and that still is a response in a, like, in a lot of different spaces. Yeah, I think I was, I was going to, I guess, piggyback on that or add. So, that made me think of the process for the um, the Shirley Chisholm competition. So we were the only people trained as architects in the finalist panel, and we were up against some pretty um, lofty mm -hmm. contemporary artists. <laughs> so was, when they announced the finals, I was like, "Lake, we're not gonna make it. We're not gonna make it." <laughs> and he's like, "We don't know bronze sculptures, but we know space, right?" So it was like it was that moment where it's like, "This is this is gonna be our secret weapon," and really mm -hmm. trying to think about. Um, once again, how to use that as a medium to tell, you know, to tell a story um, that's so incredible, but also because there was the prompt from the um, from the city to to rethink monuments, and so it it really was um, sort of like tailor made for people of our background because you know as mm -hmm. we couldn't hold a candle to the to the folks who could do more traditional sculpting, so to really speak about space and then to have that kind of sync up with a larger philosophy that Shirley Chisholm had, I think really worked to our advantage in that moment. But, you know, in general, the ability to make up stuff or to go, you know, like that's constantly having to be part of what the, especially with the public art component, right? To, to change the, what the narrative is, but to always make sure that it has those, that kind of ethos of, of what we've learned about space making, people congregating, experiential um, sequencing, those kinds of things work well in public forums and public spaces and anticipating crowds or protests and so forth. All of that is really, I think it really lends itself to our background. Yeah, to hop in there for a second, I've been thinking a lot about the Shirley Chisholm conversation that you guys might be having as you're thinking about it and look, looking at a lot of the, the drawings for it and the images for it. And there's just like, I mean, shadow has a huge role in that and thinking about shadow, light and color mm -hmm. and how like when I look at both of your work and hear you talk about it, color is, is like huge. That's one of the cornerstones where it's like, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. the signification of it? Like what place does it signify? Who does it signify all this stuff? So um, could you talk a little bit about the, that conversation that you all are having right now about shadow, color and light in public space in like, what roles that can have in like our ongoing conversation around monuments and that kind of thing? I think it's actually funny that you say that because we didn't have any conversations. I think because we were, <laughs> because we were trained together and we talk all the time, you know, somebody, I can't remember who asked, but somebody was like, was it really difficult to collaborate? And we were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I think also, you know, one, we're, we're, we're creative, you know, friends, right? So we're the people we're going to all the time to give feedback. So it's not like you had to introduce your practice to the other person or there had to be some give and take because I know how he operates. I know what his tendencies are and vice versa. So I found it was more like, it was almost like, um, you know, the Cosby show used to say challenge. It was like we would make a move and then the other person would make a move. We're like, who can make the move faster? Or you you'd hand something off and or like a cipher, I guess. And then the other person would like just riff off of that. So I think that we knew that it had to have the components of both of us, kind of both of our personalities and both of our artistic interests. And so then it also just lent itself to like strengthening the idea. So, you know, multiple vantage points for different points of view. It's at an intersection. So that lends itself to that. And then the idea of the shadow both so that she could loom even larger, but also so that 
we could have her face or her silhouette, but then at the same time, make it completely abstracted. So we're also trying to bring that audience along per the, the request of the city. So there's gonna be resistance, right? So we've already gotten emails that are like, why is, why is the black lady's hair blonde? Why does she have a croissant on her head? Like all kinds of things. And then Blake was pointing out, I was like, but her skin is green. Nobody said, why is her skin green? But we got a lot of beef about her hair being blonde, right? Like, don't do that to the people. Um, but I think, I think for us, it was, it's more an opportunity to kind of test out the things we tend to always do or the things we, we, that are recurring interests and like toss mm -hmm. that into this. So we knew without even speaking on it that it had to be compelling with shadow, that the scale mm -hmm. had to speak to the tree canopy, but also, you know, to the largeness of the figure in terms of her personality, right? So I don't even think we made a list. We just kind of knew that there were these components and then we just went about trying to refine how they work. Yeah. So the conversation now is about like, okay, the color has to be outlandish, but are these the wrong colors or what other colors are possible? Or now that budget is a real factor and fabrication is a real issue, what, what colors could be inherent to materials? What could time of day and light do to change this figure so it's completely black or sometimes it's brown or maybe it disappears in the trees, right? So we already have a kind of understanding of the context to think about that palette. It's green, it's material colors of steel or metal, you know, it's environmental colors of, of West Indian populations that are in that immediate area, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? And then obviously Shirley Chisholm with her crazy dress patterns, mm -hmm. you know, and, and her style as well, like all of that has to be in the mix, but I don't think we have any like, yeah, no, it's it, the, I, like, like I think the sort of architectural conventions of light and space and shadow, that is, I mean, that kind of just goes along with the way we think anyway, right? I mean, that, that, that happens as a function of our um, training in architecture and our own particular design sensibilities. So it's, yeah, so it's not something we discussed with more, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of a very quick fire. All right, here's an idea. Um, uh, you know, cool. Okay. Um, you know, um, when I get home from the studio or whatever, I'm going to sketch over it and then I'll get it back to you. So it really was a very, like, after pinning down the sort of basics of our conceptual approach, right? She's a, she's a small woman, but doesn't mean a statue needs to be small. We're challenging the conventions of a cast figure, right? So, you know, ours is not going to be cast, but 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 we're still going to have some dimensionality to it. It's an entrance to the park, so it's a threshold. It's a gateway. So we have to create some idea of people streaming through. There's three different approaches. Most people are going to be streaming off the subway, you know, coming way from over here. So it's simultaneously not a straight, you know, thoroughfare. So that means that it needs to have a kind of radial aspect to it, right? So that people can circumnavigate these things so it was like really more of a kind of, i mean very architectural sort of uh you know the procession of people through this space right um and then you know well we want to change it where people can occupy it in some way and interact with it more most statues are on plinths 10 12 feet tall you know and then even further up on a horse or something you know what i mean um and so, yeah, it was, it was just a lot of conversation around um, those sort of mechanics of engagement with the public. Um, but then, of course, as, as Amanda said, you know, conversations around the color, um, drawing from, you know, our Caribbean background, but also from the immediate neighborhood, the, the, courts, the kind of um, colors of the tree canopies as they, as they change from, um, you know, spring, summer, and through fall, and, and again, making the scale of um, the sculpture commensurate with the tree height, right? And also you have, you know, a viewing angle of it from, of, of like 12 blocks going down Ocean Avenue. So you see it from very far away. So, you know, folks who may have had a criticism about the size, why it's so large, it's like, you, you, you understand that like, you know, like almost a mile away, you have a completely open thoroughfare to this thing, right? And so the idea of, it being visible at that distance, but then having a lot of interesting intricacies that you see only when you're right up on it, right? So, I mean, these were all the kind of things that we were working through 
Um, but we had to do it fast. This wasn't a, <laughs> yeah, this wasn't a spin our wheels kind of thing. You, you have like a, you know, two months or a month to do um, a, a, like a full proposal where you have to, you know, propose the budget. You got to budget it out. And it's all, all these renderings. Um, and so you may actually end up using two weeks of those two months that you had being productive. So it has to happen fast, you know? Um, so, so that's why, I mean, that's why, you know, our kind of familiarity uh, with each other's practice made that process very easy. It was very easy. It was a very easy collaboration <laughs> and it was very simple because it was just like, we're just throwing it. So, so like the kind of details, um, uh, the sort of fundamental architectural details aren't things that we need to like, really hash out you know um but no i mean so yeah so now of course there's refinement we have to figure out paving it's uh it's it's also uh part of a larger parks renovation project so we have to take into consideration what the landscape architects are doing at the site um phasing and so i mean so yeah so our background as, as architects really helps us because we understand phasing and renovations, you know what I mean, multi, multi-phase projects, where along, you know, uh, along that process, our artwork is, is going to start um, fabrication or, or, you know, start being, start being built. Um, so yeah, I mean, right now it's just, you know, working through a lot of those details and the fun part, the materiality of all of it. Um, public art has to last a long time. And it's funny, the biggest pushback we get are from the conservators. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest pushback because they just want what works. You know, a, 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 you know, a metal statue on a marble plinth lasts as we see for hundreds and hundreds of years. <laughs> so they don't want us, you know, some powder coated metal that they're gonna have to come back in. You know, so we have to like, so exactly, color as material is 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 like part of you know. A, like a lot of what we're discussing right now, um, which is exciting. It's, it sounds like your background together in architecture school or your overlap, um, I mean, you, you've developed the same language um, in terms of architecture. And Amanda, your point about the guilt around leaving traditional practice is so real. <laughs> I have, um, I see an analogy, analogy to, um, to mom guilt, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. I, I, and and so when you jump off, right? When you jump off that traditional trajectory, um, all kinds of things come up. I'm sure, um, as they did for me. And I, I wonder if you are. What I'm getting to is, I wonder if you're each other's mentor uh, and each other's mentee, because when you do that jump off. Um, you know, it's a, it's an abyss, or it can be. But maybe you maybe you came to it from a different angle. Um, can you talk a little bit about your mentorship, your menteeship, and perhaps your each other's mentors? Yeah. So I I started off as um, Lake and Emmanuel Pratt's mentors, mm -hmm. and as <laughs> as Oak and Mama Sheila and Yamani and everyone else on this call who knows us well will attest to. I would I was the mother along with the yeah. uh, Sanga Bansfield Mate, who was, who was my peanut butter to my jelly. But we were bossy, you know, and we like telling them what to do. And I don't think any of them could, maybe Emmanuel could drive. Nobody could drive, so they had to pile in the car. We, you know, just always telling them what to do. And so it's been great. So even though I remember that we were a few years ahead in terms of our education and our kind of collegiate experience, we were at Cornell at a very special time when there was a critical mass of um, black and brown students in the architecture art and planning departments. And so um, this was also the mid to, yeah, mid to early to mid nineties. So this is like the proliferation of like black creativity in the whole world, right? Like hip hop is, is just kind of having an explosion. And um, so it was a moment where we were all each other's mentors and mentees within that educational environment because it's the, the school didn't quite know what to do with us. So they weren't quite at a point where they were resisting what we were talking about, but they just really didn't have a clue about how to harness kind of the best out of us. So that critical mass and that kind of camaraderie really helped us push one another and also make sure a number of us graduated who probably would not have had they been 
singular figures in that in that capacity. So it's been great now to transition from that into Lake is a colleague and actually I'm he's more of my mentor now. Like I like I wasn't joking, like at least three times a week I'm texting him at some ridiculous hour, like, but do you think if I made it like that, that it would be like that or it wouldn't should I draw it first? Maybe I should make three, right? And he's just like, just do it, or he just won't answer it all, or you know, and then I'm trying to interpret his responses, which are themselves like poems. So, you know, sometimes you don't know what, what the hell he's talking about. Um, but it's been exciting to be able to have friendships for that long of a period that really do get to transform. Um, I'm looking at my kids, like hoping that happens with them too. <laughs> like where you go, you go from having to be the one that gives all the time to now, the, you know, being able to receive or to be um, kind of colleagues. Uh, it's just, just really rewarding. And so I think, yes, we definitely still are each other's mentors. And sometimes, especially I would say in these last few weeks, it's been incredibly frustrating because we realize how few of us there are, and us being black mm -hmm. people in particular, but people of color who have astute understandings about inequities of space, who make work about it all the time, who are, you know, 400 years ahead of people who've just come to some kind of consciousness about how imbalanced this country in particular, but the world is with resources and equity and justice. Um, and so then when you look up and you're like, oh, and then and her and him, and we were in school together, and that's right, and landscape architecture. And so like, it's just exhausting. But you realize that you really are your own, you, you've admitted yourself as Tony Morrison would say, like, there's no one to go ask. There's no one to ask how to balance this. There's no one to ask how to pace this. And so that, that does too feel like motherhood where even if, if you have a mother, if you have a parent or a guardian who's, who's there, who you know has raised you, you're still alive. And then you ask them for advice and they're like, mm, give them some Cheerios, mm, <laughs> Benadryl. You know, you're like, should I, can I give them adult Benadryl or should I make it, should I water it down? It's like, I don't know if they get sick, take them to the hospital. You know, it's just like no help, nothing. You're just out here, you know? And so it's good to at least have people to laugh with when you're just like, so should we, is this what we should be doing? Like, what should we do now, right? Like, we don't have the answers and we also don't have people to kind of mentor us through the process of getting to the answer. So it's good not to be in that boat by yourself um, and to offer that to I, other people, right? Go ahead, Lake. I, I just wanna say, uh, like particularly the school part, uh, like Amanda is, is downplaying the amount of mentoring and saving and it's so funny because all of us, and it was Amanda, and it was Nsenga, and it was Hansi, and it was Nina, it was, it was actually a lot of the women, um, black women in the architecture program. And so all of us men, like we all apologized after we had graduated <laughs> because it's so inconceivable how we're like, they did all of this stuff for us while we were in school, while they were also students <laughs> in school. <laughs> So like just the amount of like literal, like, you know, having our back in every single way. I mean, um, I mean, they really made sure, man, man really made sure that people turned in their work, uh, did their drawings, literally graduated. They didn't get arrested. Know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like make sure you didn't get arrested. Make sure you needed sleep if you needed to get sleep. So I remember coming and being like, I kind of took for granted that you were actually a student in the same <laughs> rigorous program that 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 we were in, and I was like, I, I like I owe you a, a huge thank you and a huge apology. She's like, every single one of you has like had that <laughs> postgraduate epiphany. Um, so yeah, I mean, and going through that kind of program. Yeah, so now we just really because there is no real kind of precedent for art architecture you know, kind of practicing, you know what I mean? Um, which is why I definitely feel, uh, like I mentioned being like an outlier in the art world program, because people see me in various exhibits and all of this, and they assume that I know what's going on. You know, like we didn't go to MFA programs. I don't know what's a good, good like literally, whatever gallery, like I can't even think of galleries off the top of my head right now. Like, that's how much I don't know about the art world, right? So that's why I was like, I'm asking Amanda, like, is this a good gallery? Have you heard of this gallery? <laughs> what kind of, you know, because 
in the absence of that MFA, you like you have no idea what makes a kind of successful um, art practice. I simply, which in a way is a kind of good thing, because conversely, not I'm not really covetous of a lot of the things that I think art, like a lot of artists are, right? But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of career and what should I be doing, like I have a lot of conversations with Amanda around that, you know what I mean? Uh, particularly, I mean, of course now it's wildly exacerbated during the pandemic and the revolution. <laughs> but even before that, it, like there's questions of, is certain things worth my time? Is doing an interview with this publication worth my time you know what i mean like really navigating what's gonna be enjoyable and what's gonna advance your career i mean outside of you know just inspiring each other sort of create you know like creatively um but it's also yeah in the absence of of really knowing um you know the the, the kind of clear charted course for a successful artistic practice those are a lot of the conversations we have about what kind of work should we do next you know or i have this idea do you think it's gonna, like, do you think this idea is gonna be great? Do you think, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, you know, so it's, it's, it's definitely a very interesting um, and constant everyday dynamic of figuring it out. Even the moment shows that Matt has, 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 has mentioned, she will fire off a text where she's overthinking the like, <laughs> the like thematic, uh, you know, curation around the show where I'm just literally the opposite. So it's like, there's a balance because I'm just like, they're gonna get what I give them. <laughs> that's that's the way I operate. You know what I mean? But, but whereas a man is like very thoughtful about the bigger picture, you know, and she still uh, mentors a lot of us about the bigger picture of what a particular show, you know, like the opportunity that a particular show like this presents outside of just being part of a group exhibit at the moment. You know what I mean? The kind of visibility, the kind of publications, the publishing around it, you know, uh, you know, if, if you're active, if you're a professor in tenure, how the, you know what I mean? Like, these are all very, very constant, you know, sort of questions that we really fire, um, you know, back and forth. Um, because yeah, there's, there's, there's absolutely no, there's no clear way to do this. And there's no kind of, like, there's no program around this, you know? Um, so it's exciting as well, um, you know, to like really navigate all of this. Yeah, that's amazing to hear you uh, talk about all that. And it's really beautiful and uplifting and inspiring. Because um, one of the things I was thinking about, I mean, I'm maybe a little bit younger than all of you and coming from the MFA world and whatnot, I look to like Amanda in particular, I'm like, wow, Amanda's doing it. She's just like, in this space of art and architecture and like this kind of leader. And, um, and so I wondered like, oh yeah, like how, how does finding your own path turn into a kind of leadership role for the larger community? And it's, and it's really fascinating to hear all of you talk about the pressures that might keep you in a certain world when the guilt that keeps you in a certain kind of practice. But once you get out of that, you find these other people in this collective that supports you in the opposite direction and you guys are all supporting each other. And, um, and I'm wondering about that in this moment where it feels like there's this other level of like, perhaps this potential for more systemic collective support of people who are embracing a transformative energy, whether it's like re revolutionary or anti-racist or all these other things. And the way in which um, the struggling with those personal questions of like, I don't wanna be just this, can have a, have a voice and a particular voice in these more systemic, muddied conversations about systemic transformation as well. Um, so there's not an exact question in that, but it feels like there's an interesting relationship there. Yeah, I would, I would say um, I had started pre-COVID. I had started um, the year thinking that I was going to explore exactly what you're talking about, but through painting and through um, the color gray. So, so lately I've been like, I just moved from color to color and I can spend the rest of my life with the whole rainbow. Um, and so the idea that you could come to gray as black and white and then you come to gray as a chroma or like three. And so what it, what's the productivity of having to, so A, from a technical standpoint is, is a little bit harder to produce a gray. I'm, I'm oil painting right now. So with paint, 
a little bit harder to produce gray with color than it is to produce gray with black and white. And then from a, from a kind of conceptual or signification standpoint, it opens up the world for, for people who are not black or white or people who are black and white or people that have to all the time answer the question, what are you? Who wants yeah. to answer that all the freaking time, right? But so if you, <laughs> and then it requires you to like reduce who you are, right? So it's like, oh, cause then you're just talking about race or you forget gender or maybe, maybe you're gender fluid or maybe you're, tra you know, like, so what if you're albino trans uh, paraplegic, right? Like, how do you, how do you get to be, so three isn't even enough, right? Like, how do we expand or allow people to be expansive in the way they define themselves or not kind of be compartmentalized? So I don't really have the answers, but I felt like having to contend with making a bunch of grays all, on the whole, I thought I was gonna do it the whole year, right? We're gonna be super difficult, right? Like, should I use orange, should I use red? And it would just keep you present in this idea about like not compartmentalizing or not not being reducible or being open to irreducibility or something like that, right? So I think that, you know, with the kind of interruption of COVID, for me, that's one shifted to this, this Instagram kind of uh, rant that I'd been on that now has turned into an art series called What Black Is This You Say, right? It's like, Black people are trifling and they're brilliant and they don't want to be black and they try to be black when they're not and they pretend and they code switch and they do, you know, so it's, you know, so it allows this kind of ability to, to really be free of having to kind of define yourself. I would say, but at the same time, kind of hearkening back to what I was saying about realizing that it's like a moment where you're like, oh, there's no grown ups. Wait a minute, we're the grown ups. So, the rush for everybody to have an answer and a statement and a reaction and, a, and to not, no, nobody said, I'm sorry. When I say nobody, none of these institutions, none of these corporate, nobody said, I'm sorry, right? They're just like, how do we fix it right now? And can you tell me, right? And so the resistance to not do the labor comes from us having had the same sort of moment at a slightly smaller scale, again, when we were in school, right? So there were protests, uh, sit-ins, we took over the, the student, the uh, president's office at the school to protest, actually an art piece that we were defending. Uh, you know, so all of that became practice and muscle memory for right now. And so now the work is to resist the urge to do the work for everybody else, but also to like close your eyes at the painful ineptitude of the people trying to do the work on their own. So for me and for Lake and the crew that we have, we've also started to think about producing our own school, developing our own curriculum, and so I want to give a shout out to Justin Moore, who's in New York, who has just announced on, on his Instagram feed that he's going to teach two classes at the two oh, yeah. double classes at the same time. He's going to teach at Yale and Morgan State, teach a class of them together online, and then he's also going to teach at Tuskegee and Columbia at the same time. So I'm like, so not only do we have to have the answers, we have to in real time save everybody and do it at the same time in two places, all while on the computer. Like it's just, it can only happen in a pandemic, COVID, Zoom, 2020. <laughs> we, we're, we're, you know, we are our ancestors' best, wildest dreams because we learned in that less than 20 year span, all of what had not been taught and now have developed the ability to teach it to somebody else. So, you know, earlier today we were all on a, on a text like, well, why are we even doing it at these schools? Why are we begging these places that are, are inept to accept us for free, basically, because none of us is teaching at these places to do the work, you know? So it's frustrating, but it's also kind of exciting to imagine that this is potentially, you know, we're talking about a whole new kind of way of formulating scholarship. You know, it, it requires interrogations of systems and kind of tried and true ways that we respect academia. Obviously, you know, we have Ivy League degrees, so it's not like we're against the, the institution in that sense, but you know, just getting to a point where you're like, what does it really mean for everybody to be rethinking everything? And, and are we ready for this kind of work? Because this really is where we need to be. We don't need to be having the conversations about who are you? What do you call yourself? Yeah. You know, I got some Indian in me or whatever, right? We, we're past, we, we, we're doing that <laughs> 25, 30 years ago. So what should we be doing? Because we stall if, if our job right now is to help bring everybody else along again, right? Like we need to be the next level. And so Somebody said it today and I just laid down. I was like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna think about that. But it is really exciting to 
imagine that you're crafting in real time, totally new ways of being that, as you said, Gabe, then it gives other people who are uncertain, it's like, should I stay with this? Should I go with that? Am I really of this? Is this what my calling is in life? Is this the, in, the industry that's going to best manifest what I think my contribution to the world is? Like, we might as well write it down and, and copyright it, right? At this point, it's, you know, instead of the one-on-ones constantly, I think we're, we're at that moment. I didn't want to admit it earlier, so I, w- I really did go lay down. But you know, like, but that's where we are. We're there. Justin has has <laughs> he's raised the bar teaching two two places at four places at one time, two different classes. I can't I can't with him. So uh, for me, that that question you asked like brings from the hyper particular all the way to the kind of level of the systemic. Like it is a little overwhelming to realize that you have that capacity. And that's interesting, like, you know, and I like how you approach that question by this nebulous discussion of grays, right? <laughs> it was like you were building this thing that, like, we didn't really know what you were building when you started, <laughs> it. We started talking about arriving at gray through black, white, white, black, or a chroma and the complications. Um, and, then, and then moving on and then discussing the whole systemic uh, kind of institutional conversation, um, which of course is draining for anyone who has any uh, connection to those institutions. And if you're a black and a person of color or just fall outside of the kind of prevailing um, sort of dominating architecture of, of those institutions, um, that's what kind of hamstrings the conversation, right? Because the man has said they're so, they're like, they're not apologizing. They're so slow to understand it, right? Um, and, and, and so I also want to point out the fact that you were discussing, uh, you know, what kind of black, you know, that you're making in your, in, in your, in your Instagram and simultaneous, because I, I love that series. And I know a lot of people are really interested in that series. And then, um, I've been doing my speculative reimagining of Brooklyn. Right. And so the seductive thing about those two vastly different projects and approaches is that we're showing kind of like we're not dismantling the institution. I personally, I, I you know, I, that's why I'm glad Amanda shouted out Justin because that's something that I can't do, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is why when we have the moment conversation, I'm like, they're getting what I'm giving them, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to work through this wild set, you know what I mean? So, so that reimagining that both, Amanda, you know, that Amanda's doing this very abstract, uh, ways of looking at these different kind of, you know, oblique hues of black and discussing snippets of like black culture and meditation and observations with my kind of, you know, agro, um, eco, afro futurist sort of Crown Heights reimagining is reimagining not, not, not focusing everything in these institutions that we use to confer validity on our being and on our practice, but really we can kind of go do our own thing. You know what I mean? We don't have to, you know, because it's such a slow, frustrating uh, process. And so I speak to my friends who are academics and, and, you know, they have to draft the statements for their departments and for their schools. And a hundred percent of them say, they don't want to do it. It sucks that they have to do it. And 100% of them just say they have to do it because the school's going to say something stupid and ridiculous. You know what I mean? And so it's like, that's always kind of there. But then I, I, I think just the, the, the kind of, you know, what, what, what the pandemic really taught us is that the infrastructure is a complete sham. You know what I mean? The infrastructure that we hit, the, 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 the safety nets that we believe we've been operating in within this kind of, kind of you know, first world country and all that, and with, with the response to the pandemic um, and kind of the absurdity of it, you know, and, and kind of the, the absurdity of the financial market where, you know, the 1% made billions, but everybody else is just, you know, out here, right? Um, that kind of provides an opportunity. I mean, of course, I understand that, you know, that there has to be that fight to, to really kind of, you know, completely transform public policy to frame the way we all live. But for certain things, um, you know, for certain things around education and, you know, the venues of our particular field, we can really begin to think about 
operating outside of these spaces, you know what I mean? And, and kind of not, uh, which is back to my comment about being covetous of gallery representation. It's been kind of a blessing that I didn't have an MFA. I couldn't imagine going to it. I like, I get the MFA thing because they're like there and you're there with like however many of your peers and you believe in your work, but some of them get picked up before you. That's gotta be a terrifying, disorienting kind of feeling, right? To be like, yo, this, you know, you know, you know, this, like my colleague's whole show just got bought. And now they're represented by whoever. And I know I'm a good artist, but, you know, and it's that kind of institution and that kind of market that creates and it ties into kind of, you know, the, the idea of free market uh, capitalism and, and, and competition, you know? Um, and you know, that, that, that was a language surrounding the schools that we went to a highly competitive school. You know what I mean? Like, is that a good thing? <laughs> you know, like really, like, what does that mean? You know, it, 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 it means that they've truncated, you know, the kind of process in the space around who gets access to it. You know what I mean? And, and so it, it, it is really sort of has everyone sort of panicking and scrabbling in a sense. And so you know, understanding that all the sort of, you know, um, kind of transforming of the political culture needs to happen, but also really thinking that we don't have to do, um, or we don't have to, you know, flow only through these sort of institutions in terms of the way we practice, the way we think about our work, the way we think about other artists, because like Amanda said, you know, there's, there's so many more conversations now with students who don't want to just do architecture, who don't want to, you know, and architecture has needed to be a more interdisciplinary uh, uh, field for a very long time. You know what I mean? Even within the institution, there's a, you know, there, there's, there's like, I'm an architect and I'm doing this project. that's all about anthropology, but I'm not going to talk to anthropology department because I know as much as they know because I'm an architect <laughs> and architecture deals with everything. Or I know about international policy and law because my project's about law and I'm, I'm, I'm building a, a, a law library and I don't need to have conference because I know what I'm doing. It's so it's, you know, I mean, we're, we're seeing kind of like the, the real sort of instability of a lot of these different, different, um, and, and, and we're trying to divest from, having to do all of that labor, you know, like it, imagine, you know, me and Amanda are getting tons and tons of emails from everywhere, you know what I mean? Um, with, with brands, essentially, you know, whether it's a museum or whether it's a company with brands wanting us to help their brand navigate and survive this new, you know, the, the sort of new world that's, that's, that's like slowly unfolding. That's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> this has been beautiful. This has been super clarifying. Okay. There's so much that um, but we have come to our hour. <laughs> Just jump on our text though. <laughs> <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> I hear that. Well, thank you both so much. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we we say goodnight? No, thank you guys. This was great. Yeah, no, thank you for having us. Really enjoyed this. It was this exciting was to talk fun. through it as well. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Talk through it, clarify some things. Now go for a clarifying walk in the evening. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. You know it. You know it. <laughs> in the 90 degree heat, I'm looking out and it's still hot. <laughs> it's yeah. still hot. The well, swamp here. Really. You saw those children came right on cue. They want their ice cream. So this was, this was perfect. <laughs> okay. They were quiet for one hour exactly. That should be our after party. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. The after party is ice cream. I'm going to share my screen once more and um, just let everyone know about our upcoming programs. Um, so many good things coming um, ahead. And um, thank you again to both Amanda and to Lake and to Gabe, um, my partner in crime, to put this series together with our amazing team at Arts and Public Life. We've had a blast. Um, everybody um, follow Arts and Public Life in all the ways that you can. And uh, we look forward to many more and much more. Thank you again. Thank you for having us.
Appreciate it. Bye. Yeah. Bye.